talk about some of my PhD research with my supervisor Liz Pelicano and also Stephen Dakin and Mark Tibber from the Institute of Ophthalmology. So um, Stephen's already told us how important global motion processing is. He had a way footed um, video, but I've got some pictures. Um, and essentially, it's important because we live in a dynamic world with lots of moving objects. And so effectively integrating and segmenting different object motions is really important. But despite this, global motion processing actually follows quite a long, protracted development and only reaches adult-like levels around mid to late childhood. And while people are generally more sensitive to motion information when it's moving fast, it's, it also seems that this might develop differently too, so there might be an even more gradual development for slow speeds. So how is mo um, global motion processing normally assessed? Again, this is the standard motion coherence paradigm. So just to refresh you, there's a um, randomly placed dots on the screen. A proportion of them move in a coherent direction, so all going either to the left or right, in this example and then the remainder are going in random directions. We're trying to find uh, the smallest proportion of coherently moving dots required for accurate discrimination. And it's generally assumed that kids get better at global motion processing because they are able to average more, so they're able to um, sample in more and more dots. But as Stephen's already suggested, it could also be that some sort of internal noise might be limiting performance in motion coherence thresholds too. Um, and so this would mean that you'd be poorer at working out the um, direction of each individual dot. And then if you come to pull this, that's going to mean you're also going to have problems with the motion coherence task. So problem is, motion coherence can't tell us which of those factors are contributing. We're going to speculate a little bit though about how internal noise might change in development. <coughs> so Macintosh et al. started off by saying that children have increased trial by trial intraparticipant variability um, in behavioural measures um, such as reaction time. Okay? And this decreases with age. And Macintosh et al. gave two possible explanations for this um, decreasing behavioural variability. Firstly, and perhaps most intuitively, they suggested that maybe decreased behavioural variability was accompanied by, by decreased neuronal variability. So trial by trial, neuronal responses also become less variable. And that might be due to sort of maturation processes such as um, pruning. And this fits a little bit with some research from the auditory domain. Um, which suggests that there might be greater internal noise um, in 5 to 10 year olds than adults. Although I know Pete's going to you know, um, tell us about the possible caveats of this in his next talk. So, the second explanation they gave was that actually maybe variability in neural responses actually increases with age. And so we might need this sort of variability to develop a more complex brain that's more capable of. Um, adapting to different situations and exploring different states. So they're, they're two, two predictions. And the way they tested this um, was they measured um, intra-individual variability, so trial by trial variability, in a face recognition task <coughs> using EEG in children aged 8 to 15 and adults. Behaviorally, as you'd expect, children started off with more variability um, trial by trial in their response times, and this reduced with age. But weirdly, when they looked at it neurally, they found completely the opposite pattern. So actually, neurally, children seem to get more variable in their neural responses from EEG trial by trial. And this led the authors to suggest that for the brain to operate at an optimal level, a certain amount of internal noise is necessary. And in a certain way, it could be stated that a noisy brain is a healthy brain. So my research questions for this study are, firstly, does internal noise change through um, childhood? And if so, what is the nature of these changes? And secondly, if it does change, is it limiting motion coherence sensitivity? Or is it just about the ability to sample over lots and lots of dots that makes kids get better? 
So I'm really glad that Stephen did such a great job in the first session of describing this. Um, so basically, we're using the fast version um, of the equivalent noise paradigm that Stephen talked about. Um, and essentially, the idea is that we can manipulate the variability in the stimulus, so the external noise, to get an estimate of the internal noise. Okay. And um, to spare the kids from doing millions of trials, um, we just had these two conditions. So um, the no noise condition, where there's no noise in the stimulus. So the standard deviation of dot directions is zero degrees. Okay. And then we also have the high noise condition, where we fix the mean direction at 45 degrees, either to the left or right of vertical. And then we add in external noise, so we try and increase the um, standard deviation of dot directions until accurate discrimination breaks down. And from that, we can strain the equivalent noise function, and then we get our internal noise and sampling efficiency estimates. So, um, psychophysics is notoriously boring for children. So, we try to make this um, quite fun, um, and so that we can engage them, and they find it rewarding, so we get some good data out of it. So the um, equivalent noise task was presented as the Hungry Fish game. And they also got to do the Shark Attack game, which is actually a standard motion coherence paradigm. And each participant completed each of these tasks at two different speed conditions. So one was slow, 1.5 degrees per second. And the other one was fast, so 6 degrees per second. And this is due to the suggestion that there might be different, um, differently developing sensitivities for these two different speeds. And the um, kids got this logbook and they put a stamp in each of the boxes as they um, went through the task. And the levels correspond to the phases of the um, experiment. So demonstration criteria trials, practice trials, and then the real thing. So in the equivalent noise task, um, random dots, white random dots, were presented on the screen for 400 milliseconds. Participants were asked to fixate the, um, it's an anchor, you can see, in the, um, in the middle. And were asked, whilst fixating, they were asked to say whether the shoal of fish moved overall to the red or the green reef to find their food. And the guy at the top is Good Sam, who I can tell looks a bit like Elton John. Um, <laughs> and he um, is the computer guy. The kids thought they were playing against, so they had to try and get more points than um, Good Sam. So we had interleaved the no noise condition and the high noise condition, and then there was an additional 15 catch trials um, which had no noise and mean fixed at um, 45 degrees, so really easy. So I've got a couple of um, quick videos to show you the stimuli. So um, the first one has no noise in the stimulus, and the second one has noise. So there's no noise and then high noise conditions. So that again. So no noise, high noise. So um, the reason that the second one's harder is because the standard deviation of dot direction has increased. Okay, and the motion coherence task was um, fairly similar. Um, this time, um, there was a portion of coherently moving dots, and we were trying to see you know, how accurate the discrimination was and how few dots they needed. Um, there was, again, 15 easy catch trials, and I'm going to show you a couple of videos. So one has 100% coherent, so it's like a cash trial, and the other one has a proportion of incoherent moving dots. Okay. So we saw um, we saw participants aged um, five, seven, nine, eleven year olds and adults, and we saw at least twenty participants in each age group. And um, while we asked all of our kids and um, adults to fixate, we thought that maybe the younger children would be less good at fixating and that maybe they might be tempted to track the dots. Um, so what we did was we took a subset of the kids and we eye tracked them. And no adults because we didn't actually have the eye tracker when I saw all the adults, so I'm trying to see a few um, now. Um, so first of all, we wanted to check that any differences in internal noise and sampling efficiency weren't a byproduct of poorer attention in the younger children. So what we did, we took the um, proportion of catch trials that they got wrong and we estimated a lapse rate from this. And surprise, surprise, um, 
The younger kids were worse. They did have more inattentional lapses. So what we did was um, we ran an ideal observer model, assuming different levels um, of lapse rates, and then we could correct each individual's threshold based on the lapse rate. So all of the values I'm going to show you from now on are going to be these lapse corrected values. So first, let's look at internal noise. So um, overall, there is more internal noise um, for the slow condition than for the fast condition. And also, it seems that internal noise reduces um, as a function of age, and we fit um, exponential functions to the data here, to the individual data um, relating age with internal noise. And there was no interaction between age and speed condition. And that basically means that the, the slopes um, of the two functions are very similar too. So they, they seem to develop in a similar um, rate for the slow and fast speeds. Now looking at sampling efficiency, well there is greater sampler efficiency for the fast speed. People, um, people are averaging more dots for the fast condition than in the slow condition. And sampling efficiency increases with age. There is a significant interaction here between age and speed. Um, but when we looked at the actual um, slopes of the exponential functions, they didn't vary significantly. So it seems to be that the rate of doing that might be, might be similar, but what is driving the interaction is these kind of weirdly performing seven-year-olds. So they don't show, um, they're actually on a biggest group, which is kind of strange, but they don't show a difference between the two speed conditions. And actually, if we look back to the internal noise, they were doing a little bit weirdly here as well, so they're actually doing a little bit better, like have lower internal noise than the nine-year-olds. Um, so, it might be a question of seeing a few more seven-year-olds to see whether this is actually telling us something or if it's just the group with them. Um, okay. So, um, we know that internal noise uh, reduces with age and that sampling efficiency increases. But how does this relate to the standard paradigm of motion coherence? So on this graph, um, plotted is every single um, participant um, in the two conditions. And for internal noise, we find that there is no relationship between internal noise and motion coherence thresholds. But sampling efficiency does. So um, higher sampling efficiency is related to lower motion coherence thresholds, and that goes for both the slow and the fast condition. Did you push me, John? Or is that what you're just about well, to be <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so next, we did a regression model um, where we put age in first because we know that motion coherence changes with age, um, and then we added in internal noise and sampling efficiency together. And we found a similar pattern again, so sampling efficiency significantly predicts motion coherence thresholds above and beyond the effect of age in both slow and fast conditions. Internal noise doesn't. So next we wanted to see whether any difference in <coughs> sampling efficiency or internal noise might be to due to this uh, ability to maintain fixation. So what we did, we had an x and y coordinate for every single fixation. And then um, we, the, this blob represents one fixation just in this diagram. And then we worked out the mean stimulus direction, so whether it was going to the left or right or vertical. And then we rotated, rotated everything so that everything was presented relative to a vertical direction. We then took the standard deviation of these rotated values as a measure of fixation stability. So how widely distributed the fixations are. We also took another measure, <coughs> anisotropy, from taking the ratio of the standard deviation along the x and y axes. So if the, um, if the standard deviation um, along y exceeds that along x, then the ratio will be under 1, and this is, means that the fixations are elongated along the stimulus direction, and so it's indicative of tracking. So, let's look at that data. So first of all, with the uh, fixation stability, we don't find any uh, differences between the speed conditions in fixation stability, so we've collapsed the data here, so that's both conditions um, in these ones. There was... Um, Increasing fixation stability with age, so the standard deviations go down. And overall, um, 
And there was slightly higher standard deviation, so less stable fixation in the equivalent noise task and the motion coherence task. Um, there weren't any significant interactions. Looking at the um, anisotropy, again, no difference between conditions, so they're collapsed here, speed conditions. Um, and overall, there's no main effect of age. So it's not that the younger children are tracking more overall than the older ones. But, and there's no overall difference between tasks, but there is a um, significant um, interaction between age group and task. And when you break that down, you see that here there are no age-related changes. No significant age-related changes. But in the motion adherence task, the uh, five-year-olds seem to be tracking more, so that, because they're under one, so they're, they're tracking more than the other age groups. So in the subset of kids that we saw with these fixation measures, we wanted to see how this would relate to the internal noise and sampling efficiency that we've got from the equivalent noise analysis. And I think this is quite interesting. So fixation standard deviation is related to internal noise in both slow and fast conditions. And it's not related to sampling efficiency. And anisotropy, so the tracking, does not correlate with either internal noise or sampling efficiency. Um, and it reflects some previous research um, into uh, people with albinism. So people with albinism and nystagmus show levels of higher internal noise compared to controls, whereas those with, um, with albinism and without nystagmus don't. So in that, it was suggested that perhaps abnormal eye movements kind of change the pattern of information coming in, which ultimately disrupts the ability of the motion pathways to form normally. Um, what the exact relationship is here in this typically developing sample is kind of unclear, and I've thought of two, two, two possible ways. So perhaps maybe it's that um, they're poor at fixating, so the individual estimates they get of each dot kind of a bit, you know, bit bit worse, and that kind of drives the change in internal noise. Or maybe it could be that fixation stability is just another index of neural variability. So I'm not quite sure of the direction there. And going into your conclusions, so overall, we found that internal noise does reduce through development, sampling efficiency increases. But internal noise doesn't seem to limit this global motion processing in the motion coherence task, whereas sampling efficiency does. And developments in internal noise, we try to control for attentiveness, so that the attention lapses. And we also know that developments in internal noise and sampling efficiency aren't due to um, tracking. But interestingly, internal noise is related to fixation stability. So I'm going to leave with um, some questions, which I'm not going to give an answer for, but maybe you will. Um, so firstly, think back to the beginning of, of my talk where I gave Macintosh et al's two possibilities. So one prediction that they had was that maybe neural variability might decrease, and one was that it might increase. Our results seem to suggest that neural variability decreases with age. Um, but we've got to think about how that relates to their findings of increased variability in the EEG um, trial by trial. Um, and what are the different mechanisms underlying these um, two different sort of patterns? Um, also, I've, we've established that um, internal noise is not limiting the development of motion periods after five years, but maybe it has a role for earlier in development. Um, and to kind of clarify the nature of, of the relationships of what's causing what when we're looking at fixation stability and internal noise. And finally, uh, I think it'd be good to see whether these results, these results of increasing um, sampling efficiency and reducing internal noise, also um, can be generalised to other integration tasks and um, developments, um, and also maybe whether it can be uh, generalised to other modalities, like the auditory. Um, so, thank you to all the participants who took part, um, there's a couple sitting in this audience, I think, um, to Yanina Breed and Becca McMillan for help with testing, and to the ESRC for funding my PhD.